Okay. It's so American, isn't it? Okay, so American. Okay, we should be live. Awesome. I can see live. Yay, we are live. So, Wildly Empowered Women, I have such a special guest for you tonight, the wonderful Nikki Goldstein. I'm going to share a little bit about her so that you've got some context as to who this beautiful woman is. So Nikki has a bachelor degree in psychology, a postgrad in counselling and a doctorate in human sexuality. She is someone that has so many accolades when it comes to media. You, you may recognise her face or have seen her before. She's a published author, a podcast host, and she's done a lot of um, consulting for different brands. And I actually met Nikki working on a brand many years ago in my PR days um, <laughs> and have followed her ever since and really, really look up to her and, and the message that she has around really normalising sex and conversations around sex and in particular sex toys and she's got her own um, sex toy shop online which we'll talk about a bit later as well so she's a really well-known sex educator and if you do follow her you will have seen a lot of her content is really empowering around normalizing sex toys as well and you guys would have seen in here I started doing sex toy reviews and um, you know being part of the conversation as well and you know, it was a virgin to this prior to <laughs> prior to Nikki opening my eyes. I've always been a, a bit of a DIY gal. So it's been um, a very empowering journey. And the reason why I really love talking, um, you know, on this topic and why I'm so honoured to have Nikki here tonight is self-pleasure is such a, a beautiful worthiness and empowerment journey. And it's a topic that I think you know, we all have a cocktail or a glass of wine with our friends and we talk about our sex life, but we don't really talk about self-pleasure and it's not really spoken about quite as much. I'm not sure why, um, you know, and, and in the post that I did promoting this, I was saying, you know, what's your story around self-pleasure? Do you have a story around that that might potentially need some um, looking at, you know, like do you feel like it's dirty or you're not worthy enough of it or it's not something that you prioritise in your life? And how could that possibly be showing up in your life in other areas? So it's a really juicy topic that I'm excited to get into. So thank you so much for joining me, Nikki. Very excited to have you here. Thank you for having me and giving me an excuse to get out of my gym clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Everything I do these days is just like gym clothes, jumper. But I'm getting, you know, like there's this whole thing about actually getting used to lockdown and being like embracing it so um but every so often you've got to you know remember what your other clothes look like yeah absolutely I mean yeah getting dressed up but I, I thought I would wear something um a little bit you know sensual and make, sexy, make myself feel a bit sexy out. yeah yeah it's the right. bar bar boom look yeah <laughs> so we've both got our hair and makeup on nowhere to go <laughs> thank god there's people watching <laughs> So my first question, and thank you to the ladies in here for asking a few questions as well, um, was around the benefits of self-pleasure physically and emotionally and, and mentally. And if you can talk us through the, the benefits of that. So it's, it's really funny, and obviously someone coming from the media world will appreciate this, but a lot of the times I've been asked to speak on these articles that look at the scientific benefits of self-pleasure and masturbation. And I always have a little bit of a giggle about it because it's like, oh, can we only talk about it that it increases blood flow and decreases chances of heart attack and helps you get to sleep and, you know, all these things. And, you know, when we talk about female empowerment, one of my frustrations when I was in these positions where I had to speak to the more medical benefits of self-pleasure is why can't we just say it feels good? You know, mm -hmm. what is the shame around saying this is a really pleasurable sensation? It feels good. I enjoy it. I like touching myself. Instead, often in the mainstream context, we always had to talk about these medical benefits to, you know, even sex, but especially self-pleasure because otherwise it's taboo. So, you know, we don't ask men what the, what the benefits are to masturbating. We just kind of tolerate and accept the fact that men go through puberty and this is just kind of part of the mix. But for women, it's so important that we 
you know, bust these myths that this is something that is taboo and it's something we should be doing because how can we communicate to somebody else what we enjoy and what we like if we don't know ourselves? Mm. If we've never explored our body, if we don't know what it feels like to touch certain areas, different sensations, then how on earth are we supposed to say to someone else, hey, this is what I really enjoy? So you have that aspect of it that it's so important to actually learn about your body and learn about your pleasure. But I also believe that this is a way to take control of your sexuality. And those words were always a little bit conflicting to me. I like to really translate lingo because I do think that we are in this space where we have all these mantras and that's great. But a lot of them I sit and go, what does it actually mean? So Mm. when we constantly heard this term about owning our sexuality, it's like, what does owning our sexuality mean? And a big part of it for me is actually taking control of the sexual pleasure that you want. And one way to do that is actually by self-pleasuring yourself the way that you want. You know, if you enjoy using a toy or using your hand or watching porn, listening to music, listening to audio porn, these are all ways to own your sexuality because you are doing what you want to be doing at that time, which is taking control of your sexuality. And when we look at the journey of especially young women, that messaging is so important because they need to understand that their sexuality really is theirs and they are in control. It's not something that you do to get someone to like you. It's not something that you give away. It is completely yours. It's within your control. And by encouraging yourself pleasure, especially from a young age, not only are we able to teach women about their bodies and what they like, but it's a really strong way to be able to teach women about what it is to really be in control and own your sexuality. Mm. That is so powerful. Like, I think also we, yeah, from such a young age, the media and Hollywood and everything that a young girl would see on screen is that a woman is submissing to a man and that they need a male for pleasure rather than owning it and being like, actually, I don't need you. (laughs) That's it. You're the cherry on top. (laughs) Yeah, even that strong, sexy woman, when you look at the narrative of, the bigger picture it's she's strong and she's sexy to entice someone else Mm. that's the that's the scary thing is that women you know this we've evolved as to what the ideal should be and even the strong woman now is done for someone else's benefit in a lot of these contexts Mm. so it's like can we just be strong for ourselves it's Mm. it's great to feel attracted to someone but I think that real attraction is when you are organically you because you can't be in a relationship faking it the whole time. You know, Mm -hmm. being in a relationship with that healthy level of attraction is someone that's going to look at you in your natural skin and in your natural state and go, oh, my God, that that really turns me on. That person is really sexy. But when we are pushing women to force themselves to be this ideal, then it's not sustainable. It's a false level of attraction Mm -hmm. and things will shift and people will go, oh, hang on, things aren't the same as they used to be or we don't have that physical intimacy. Well, maybe because you were pushing so hard to be something that you're not and Mm. that's not organically you. Mm. Yeah, that's really powerful. I think, and and it keeps like coming back to, I, I just keep thinking my mind like it's it's about you it doesn't have to be it's not about someone else it's like about your relationship with yourself and that's why I feel with self-pleasure it's such a beautiful practice of self-love and getting to know your body more getting it's it's actually making love to yourself so it's really getting to know your body actually feeling worthy of that loving yourself it's a practice it's like if you were to make love with your lover or a partner or or you know, whoever, you would actually spend the time to mentally be in the space. You would like make your environment romantic. You'd maybe put on some music, lights and candles, whatever. Like if you're not giving yourself that time, it means that you're almost like saying, I'm not worthy enough. Like I'm not going to do that for myself. I am only doing that for someone else. You're not actually giving that time and that amount of attention to your own body. But I think there's also a side to this where we can take it too far into self-love right and I'll try Mm -hmm. explain myself because I'm really big into equality and I'm really big into well why is it like this for 
one particular gender and not another. And Mm -hmm. I even feel guilty sometimes when I do this gender comparison because I'm also aware and respect that people identify their gender in not just a binary state these days. Mm -hmm. But when we have a look at female sexuality in specific, and it was one acknowledged that female sexuality is how you identify as being a female. I'm not talking specifically about vulva owners, but we do have to look at how we have been pinned against men for so many years because that's how our sexuality has been repressed. So if we have a look at this idea that women's masturbation, let's call it masturbation for a second, let's look at the idea that women's masturbation has really been pushed into this terminology of self-love, which, yes, it is. It is a way that you can love yourself. It is a way to make love to yourself. However, I also think it's important to use these interchangeable terms that we use self-pleasure, but we can also use masturbation because men masturbate Mm. and they don't do it out of self-love. They do it because they're horny. And there's nothing wrong to say to women, you know what, do it because you're horny and do it because it's pleasure and it feels good. It can be a beautiful thing when you feel like you need a little bit more time on yourself and you're exploring your body and you want to explore rituals but you also might have those moments in your life where you're like geez I'm horny (laughs) and maybe your partner's not you know around at the time or you're pissed off with them so you're like I don't want to have sex with them or you know you're in lockdown at the moment and you're single and you're thinking yeah I'm gonna stick on some porn and I'm gonna grab some toys and I'm gonna masturbate because it feels good And I think that's whole part of the permission when we talk about owning our sexuality, we have to look at this act in different ways. Mm. And that's nearly sometimes with female sexuality, we desexualize women. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, it's, it's great to be in touch with our sexuality and to love ourselves, but we also need to make sure that we are able to talk about our sexuality and explore it just like men do. Mm. And that is purely on the fact of being just really straight up and honest and being like, It feels good if Mm. I touch myself. It feels good when I rub my clitoris. It feels really good if I grab a big crystal wand and stick it internally and listen to audio porn at the same time. Mm. I think those are kind of the things sometimes that I wish that we had more of out there so that women just know that there are all these options available to explore in this space. Mm. Some people prefer this idea of calling it self-love and the act being more about love other women just like getting off other Mm. women sometimes feel like they need a little bit more love and that might be a different way and different technique that they do it and then sometimes they're just like I'm actually super horny and it's going to be this crazy hardcore session with myself but if we have that narrative and we see women talking like that then I think it gives the permission for us to explore self-love and masturbation just like we have seen men do it for so long Mm. which is with this level of acceptance Mm. yeah I I never remember as a teenager anyone tapping me on the shoulder or receiving the messaging that said you know here's a way that you can explore your sexuality or it's okay to pleasure yourself but I remember the jokes and I remember you know all the you know content whether it was in movies or tv shows or anything about boys masturbating and it was kind of like this little joke but it was very tolerated Mm. and a great example of this one of my favorite tv shows is weeds have you ever watched that one Mm. yeah okay so there's a great scene that I've used in many presentations and the younger boy um well the first of the plumber comes out because the pipes are blocked and the plumber turns to her mum and says um, someone's been flushing tube socks or like sports socks down the toilet. So they work out very quickly that this little boy has been masturbating and ejaculating into tube tube socks and trying to get rid of them. So she can't handle it. So in she brings his uncle and he gives them this like very frank little speech about how to masturbate where to ejaculate like tissue shower this and it's it goes so quickly but it's like boom 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 and I'm thinking no one would do that to a no. girl of the same age and I think he was all of 12 or 13. So you know we really have to change the narrative for women at younger ages so that they grow up with this permission mm-hmm. and acceptance so that they're not women in their 20s 30s 40s 50s 60s who still have this issue and this insecurity about touching themselves. Mm. 
I think lockdown is the perfect time for a conversation about this too, because we're all <laughs> locked down, we've got a bit more time, we're at home, we've got little moments of time where we can experiment a bit. And I think, you know, you've raised a really good point and, and especially talking about ages that regardless of the age, if you're not self-pleasuring, masturbating, taking some time to get off on your, on your own, how can you know what you want when you are with, with someone? Like it, it's just as important that way. Like it's taken me so many years to figure out what I like and I'm still on that journey and, you know, a whole new bloody Pandora's box is open for me now too of, of working that out. But I started exploring it a few years ago and for me it wasn't just for me. It was also like I actually wouldn't even know what to say to my husband, you know, like I just didn't even know where to start with like what I actually wanted because I didn't know what I wanted. And that's actually how it all started for me being like, I can't be frustrated if I'm not satisfied because I, I haven't actually explored that properly myself. So where, where do you think, like, if you've got any advice, where do you think people should start with that? Like if they don't really know what they want and they're just like, what's available for me, where do you think they should start at, particularly with toys? Well, I think, first of all, start anywhere. You know, people can get so worked up. And the more you get anxious and nervous about what do I do and we are a society that's kind of really oversaturated with information that sometimes makes us feel inferior. And it's great that we have all this content and information. And as someone who creates that, I hate sometimes that I'm kind of even putting myself down, but I try and also create stuff that's useful. But people can get stuck in that headspace of like, oh, my God, what do I do first? Start touching yourself. Like it's that simple is that if you spend some time, whether it's just fondling yourself, you know, exploring your genitals, it's a trial and error situation. So you might start touching yourself. And if you are more relaxed, that's the best headspace to be in because that's where you've got to pay attention to, oh, this feels good. Spending time with yourself and going, well, what fantasies come to my head? Like, what am I curious about? That's the questions you need to be asking yourself. What am I curious? What what do I want to have a look at? Because I can tell you all these different things, but I'm not you. you know? And what I like and what you like are going to be completely different things. And it's like, sometimes I feel it's kind of like pulling this information out of someone's brain. But the best way to do this is to give them that permission that it's okay to start doing this. So if you just start exploring your own body and then you're able to start asking those questions of yourself around, what do I like? Or what am I curious about? Watching something like porn is actually can be a really great sexual aid in saying that I've got to put like a little asterisk like warning I'm a very um porn positive person but I'm also very realistic about what porn is and there's a lot of porn out there that purely is for entertainment purposes right it is not um real uh I've been on many sets because I wanted to investigate this I can tell you what goes on behind the scenes. It's it's like a movie, right? It's like we don't we know that that person isn't really driving that car and isn't really jumping off that cliff. It's the same thing, but the problem is because we can actually have sex and we see them having sex, we think that we can do what they do anyway. But there's a lot of different platforms out there that are called ethical, female friendly, um, that not necessarily you're being like soft and romantic versus hardcore, but the idea is to be a little bit more real and transparent. But Things like this are really great to have a look at and think, well, does that interest me? Does that excite me? Um, audio porn. I think audio porn is a mm -hmm. great thing that we don't see promoted enough. Um, there is a site called Femtasy um, that comes from, I think it's German. Uh, so two sites in particular, these are good resources. Femtasy is an audio porn and Get Cheeks, C-H-E-E-X, um, they do a lot of ethical porn. So even being able to watch something like that and see what excites you, right? There might be something on there where you think, oh, I've never tried that before or, oh, I feel a bit of a response to that. It's a great way to introduce yourself to something new mm. and different. You've also then got to consider that it might just be a turn on. It might not be something that you want to explore further. And fantasies are fantasies. Fantasies are not necessarily reality. And this is where we get it wrong, is we have to really work out. That felt good to watch and that really excited me and I felt my heart rate go up a bit. But is it really something that I want to do? Or is it really something I want to explore? And it's like putting it through your own filters and kind of mm -hmm. working out, let's think about that. Like, how's that going to work? So it's mm -hmm. a great place to start getting these ideas 
but then we kind of have to stop and work out is that something that I want to go further with now yeah. I'm an absolute huge fan of sex toys obviously um but it's one of the reasons why I started a sex toy website because when it comes to self-pleasure and women there's so much technology out there that can help us and why wouldn't we utilize that there's all these different sensations and there's suction devices and there's things that vibrate and there's things that get inserted and there's external things and it's just ridiculous what we actually have access to so I also do advise people that that's a great area to start because you might not be aware of what sensations that you actually enjoy until you have tried something that's available. Um, you're not going to know if you necessarily like a clitoral suction device until you have tried a clitoral suction device. So it's a little bit of experimentation, but it's not exactly a bad form of experimentation to be doing. Mm, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I'm going to put it out there for those watching because we've got quite a few on. Um, if you've got any questions that you want Nikki to answer or any particular topics, just pop them in the comments as well because I'm just watching them here. Um, but while we're waiting for any comments. So, yeah, wow, um, some great topics that we've covered so far. Anything else on self-pleasure, just pop them in the comments, guys, because we're going to move on to the next one. Um, and I just wanted to note, I made a self-pleasure playlist for Wildly Empowered Women, which I, <laughs> I did share the other day. So that's one that you are welcome to whip out tonight <laughs> after our talk, if you like, guys, <laughs> um, and add to it. I think there's a few things that obviously, you know, it's a personal preference, absolutely, but um, that can really set the scene and help you get in the mood. And, and something for me is always music. Like I've always had my certain um, songs on a playlist and that's always been what I've self-pleasured to or put on when we're about to have sex um, or, you know, just getting in the mood even. Um, so, yeah, I would highly recommend going and having a look at it, guys, and, or making, creating your own. Like it's something that, um, you know, can just be a beautiful thing for you to have even on, on your own and for yourself. Speaking um, of music, I'll give you a really good little tip and this is for people that have a TV in their bedroom. There's a channel called SBS Chill and it has bubbles that go up the screen. It's great because it's like chill, relaxed music and the bubbles are very like relaxing and it, and it has this ability to kind of numb you and just like there's, you know, relaxed mm -hmm. mind. Because that's one of the important elements is that you have to get out of your head because your body organically when you're touching itself will tell yeah. you what it wants to be doing. But if you're thinking about all sorts of things, so it's, really finding music that gets you in the mood but also just kind of calms you down a little bit to be able to tune into the sensations of what things feel like and stop thinking or overthinking about what is actually going on mm, yeah good point that that is um that is a really big thing because also to orgasm it's the most vulnerable state that you're in so you need to like not think too much about it almost and like let it go and just allow yourself to surrender. So I, it's also why, because I'm such a like thinker, it's also why it works so well for me because I actually have to get out of my mind, like out of my brain when I'm like in that mood. And yeah, music is such a good portal for that. So that's that's awesome advice. SBS chill, everyone. I think we need like a resources. I'm going to do, I'll do a comment with the resources that you've mentioned. These are really good. Um, I have a station playing often at home. That's awesome. Go Crystal. Okay. So next question, it wasn't really a question, but I, but it was definitely a topic that, um, someone wanted discussed was society's expectation on what we should look like down there. And in particular hair, which I think is a very topical, um, relevant one right now in lockdown, because whether you like it or not, there's no options where we're Nikki and I are in week 10 of lockdown. So even if we wanted to have a certain style down there, all options are off the table. So it's an interesting one though, because, you know, there are so many societal expectations of what we should look like. And, and, you know, that's a whole nother topic, but particularly down there and, and interesting that you've witnessed a porn being made. I'm very interested to hear about that. Where do you think that comes from? And do you think that that's changing a bit now, especially with, um, you know, there's a lot of women, labiaplasty is the highest growing cosmetic surgery. I read that this morning. Like it's, it's crazy. And wh where do you think it's going? I know you're 
biting a bit to talk on this. <laughs> well, I have I have somewhat contra- controversial. I call them controversial because I've had feminists before tell me that, like, pretty much get up at me for my views about pubic hair. Um, but I think what's really good to actually look at is how pubic hair started to disappear. And really what we, it, it is due to porn because porn is all about getting a camera in there to see what's going on. It's all about angles. And that's why even like when you look at the positions that people are in, they're really uncomfortable. So the reverse cowgirl, which is one of the most popular, whereas, you know, the guy's kind of behind and he's supporting himself on his arms and he's out long and the girl's kind of sitting on top. That is because if I do legs like this, say those are the two legs of the people and there's penetration going on there, get a camera straight in there. Um, But it's very uncomfortable to do. Same thing with doggy style. Doggy style is not just doggy style like maybe you do without a camera. A guy actually has to flip his hip out because you've got to get a camera in there. So it's very uncomfortable doggy style for a long time because you can kind of do a hip injury. That's my little behind the scenes of porn. But when we have a look at this idea of camera angles, pubic hair started to be removed so you could see what was going on. You think about that 80s bush, you know, that kind of hides a lot, right? You can't really see a penis going into a vagina, can you? It's kind of a little bit hidden. So we started to see pubic hair become removed in porn and then it felt very taboo because isn't this naturally what women are supposed to do and, oh, it's only something that porn stars do and women wanted to be like porn stars and Bob's your uncle, we're taking hair off. You know, I think that there is this, um, I won't call it a myth, but there is this push or people think that the whole reason why women are pressured to take, remove their hair is because men worship youth and they want them to be younger now I'm not going to say that that isn't the case for everybody because I do believe that that may be the case for some people but I think it's really dangerous just to slap that idea on the whole idea about hair removal Um, also too when we have a look at hair removal if we take a partner out of the situation a lot of people prefer the sensation of smooth skin whether it's their hands, whether they're in partner sex, whether they're using toys, it can be a lot more sensitive. Now, I also explored the the idea of oral sex for women. Um, I wrote a book in 2019 that hasn't been published and has been sitting there. Thank you, COVID, for um, destroying that one. But when I was looking at the removal of pubic hair, I explored the idea of oral sex for women. And I thought, If we switched the genitals around in heterosexual situations, right? So men had the vulvas, we had the penises. We'd probably be turning around to them going, I ain't going down there till you clean that thing up or I ain't going down there till you remove that hair because, you know, it can feel, I mean, some people really love a mouthful of fluff, but for some people they feel like they can't really get in there enough because Mm -hmm. they've got bits of hair in their mouth. So if we were doing that to them, Women would be the ones saying to men, hey, can you just go get a bit of a wax before I go down on you? So, but because that messaging sometimes comes from men to women, we go, hang on, this is misogyny. You want me to remove my hair. I, I remember going through a period, actually, when I was studying sexology and I was like, no, I'm keeping my hair on. Like, I'm, this is my body and I'm going to do what I want. And then I remember having sex and thinking, I hang on I actually prefer it without and it was kind of one of those light bulb moments and I was like no no I prefer it this is not about these guys like this is about me and my sexual pleasure so I also asked um friends of mine that were in same-sex relationships because I was like okay if I go with this theory that a part of the motivation to remove hair could be for sexual pleasure from both ends Let's go outside of the heterosexual dynamic. So we get rid of this whole idea of misogyny for a minute. And let's ask two women. And I was quite surprised how many of my friends in same-sex relationships were saying, yeah, I really go enjoy going down on her when there's no hair because I feel like I can lick the area and I feel like it's more sensitive. So I kind of went with this idea of maybe this is a debate that sometimes gets a really bad rap. Again, not dissing this idea that there are men who want to dictate and there are men who think that you know it has to be this way because they've watched too much porn and because it signifies youth but we also need to look at the other debates when it comes to removing hair and consider that there are women out there that prefer it 
there are people out there in couples that prefer the removal of hair because of sexual practices, whether that's oral sex or anything else. Some people think it's more sensitive. Um, you know, there are all these other things to it. So what's really important when you have a look at your decision of why you either want to keep your hair or remove your hair, what's really important to actually ask yourself why? You know, mm -hmm. is it because you prefer it? Are you doing it because you feel like you have to do it to please someone else? That's kind of the one I'd go, alarm bells, hang on. Mm -hmm. Let's actually bring it back to how you feel about it. So that's what's really important is that whatever decision that you make, because there's no right and wrong of this, you actually need to ask yourself why you're making the decision. What are the reasonings behind it? There's no right or wrong reason in saying that. I don't love the idea of doing it for someone else, but let's call a spade a spade. You know, my partner loves the idea of removal of hair. Mm. I'm not going to tell him that he's a pig for wanting that. Um, there are certain things like I want his back hair removed and there's laser, no laser clinics open. <laughs> I love I get to throw him on the bus when he's on all these lights. So it's like, <laughs> hang on, if I'm telling him to remove his back hair, yeah. am I not, is that not the same position? So, but I just think it's important to be aware and explore this a little bit. Instead of demonising the idea of why women are removing their hair, sometimes we actually just have to look at our own reasoning as to why we are the we are the like it or we don't like it. Mm. But cubic hair is making a comeback in porn. Interesting. Has been for years, not the full 80s bush, but like a little bit. Because again, you know, we're going back to this idea that, you know, people want to see what's going on. So it's not enough hair that it's covering the whole area. But often I've seen a lot of girls have like a landing strip or they kind of have a little shape or kind of an area. Um, mm -hmm. But you, we are seeing it a lot more in porn. So when mm -hmm. there is this whole notion of, oh, everybody has expected to remove their pubic hair because people watch too much porn, um, people watch too much porn these days would be seeing pubic hair. So yeah. we can't always just rely on that as the reason why women or certain women feel influenced to remove their pubic hair. Interesting. And I think that is such a great point to make of just ask yourself why and do you want to do it for you? Like who really cares? Really, if you want to do it and, and you feel good about it, it doesn't really matter as long as you've asked yourself why and you're not doing it out of like pure obligation and, and it's not actually what you want. But I agree, like sometimes there's things like beauty things that I just want to do because it makes me feel beautiful. It makes me feel sexy. It makes me feel confident. And it's not necessarily for my husband. I don't even know if he likes it or not, but it, it just makes me feel good. And, and I think, yeah, like exactly like the self-pleasure thing, like you can go deep in it and really think super deep about it, or you can just be like, is this something I want to do? <laughs> Does this feel good for me? Yeah. I mean, see, the hard thing is even saying that, you know, the whole idea of the labiaplasties, um, that's to a whole nother level. And I'm really not a fan of altering the vulva area in that way, in kind of any way, cosmetically. Um, because I do think, you know, we could use the same debate of someone saying, but it feels good for me. Um, but I do think there's much a, a much bigger difference to removing pubic yeah. hair than actually cutting into your labia. And mm -hmm. I have heard and I've heard women come to me telling me horrible stories. I'll never forget one woman came up to me in an event and she was telling me these stories of how she just felt butchered, absolutely butchered. And I was nearly in tears listening to her because I thought, you know, no one should be made to feel like that. No one should have to go mm -hmm. through what you went through. And I do think that we need to find that balance of also embracing what different vulvas look like. Yeah. Again, you know, vulvas, labiaplasties, I mean, there's rumours about how common they are in the porn industry. Um, I know a lot of female porn stars and I can tell you none of them have altered their labia. Um, but, you know, I think when we look at empowerment, owning sexuality, part of those conversations also need to be pictures around what every different woman looks like and how normal it is mm -hmm. and that we do not look the same and we do not look edited. Um, is it, there's two particular magazines in Australia, I probably won't even say their names, but I remember many, many years ago um, working for Sexpo and they were always like free and running around. And one of the girls was showing me how they, they edited it out so there's no 
there's like no slit it was like a barbie but everything's kind of shaved down so it looks really like a barbie doll and i remember thinking to myself oh my god this is this is actually where it starts that people think that that is mm. normal they grow up looking at these images um you know we can't miss the difficulties where the hell do you show this stuff you know mm. we can't on social media i can't even promote um certain sites and there's some great ones out there that show um, different folders at different stages. Um, there's even this great site, I hope it's still around, called My Beautiful Cervix and actually shows you the different stages of a woman's cycle about what her cervix looks like. Um, and a lot of this content is so heavily censored and it's so, yeah. it's so taboo. So what place does it have? Like how on earth are we supposed to get women used to the idea of what different bodies and different vulvas look like if we really don't have a safe space to put it. So it's a bit of a tricky one. And I think some people try and use the debate for labiaplasty as, well, I feel more confident and I feel better about myself. And that's what makes me mentally, you know, there's that flow and effect. But I just think there's a completely different thing to removing pubic hair or the jazzling or you know doing any of those beauty enhancements to actually taking to your vulva with a knife yeah that is definitely a few steps further than than hair or no hair which will grow back anyway um yeah that's an interesting one um well something you said before made me think um I'm not sure what I was going to say. Something on labiaplasty. Um, I've completely lost it now. Anyway, it is a very interesting one and thank you for sharing. Oh, that's right. I went to a pleasure workshop about, I, I was pregnant with Freddie, so it would have been about a year and a half ago. And it was so interesting. It was run, run by a sexologist actually that I used to work with um, when I worked in PR. And she was saying that, and I don't remember all of the details about it, but she was saying that a, a while ago, and possibly this is still the case now, in porn, you actually weren't allowed to have a porn star shown where the labia, oh. Hang on. Oops, sorry. There you go. I That's forgot right. one thing. I forgot. I forgot to turn my calls off. I realized oh, that's, right. that. that's okay. right. She's my brother. Um, yeah, she was saying that because we were talk, we were all discussing this because it was a women's pleasure workshop. So obviously we were all talking about labias and stuff. And she was saying that in porn, you actually aren't allowed to show a labia with anything hanging out, basically. So they, yeah, in in porn magazines, and this may not be the Mag- case. This is the, mag- yeah. Yeah. this is the magazine, not the um not the videos, but that's the not same when the they edit, yeah. they edit they it. It's like it a Barbie all. doll. Yeah. So, wh- yeah, exactly. So where do you actually see a real one? And that brings me to an Instagram account that I was so grateful to find. Someone actually sent it to me this morning where um, it, it's this amazing female photographer and she's got an entire, I'll have to send it to you, you'll love it. She's got an entire website of all different labias, like literally 100 and then all different, just vaginas straight on. And and the purpose, she's like, I want women to see the diversity and that there's nothing wrong with you. Like mm-hmm. nothing wrong with you. There is no normal. There's literally no what a labia should look like, what a vagina should look like. But there's everything in between. And, you know, everyone's heard of the wall of vaginas in, in Tasmania. Um, we only there recently. <laughs> yeah, I mean, which is such a great, like, beautiful artwork and it's such a great message. But I think it would be great if that was more attainable also for young, younger women, you know, like who are just, like, starting to look at themselves and see themselves and don't really have anything to compare it to except for if they turned on porn, <laughs> yeah. you know, and saw a perfectly, you know, a, a what society thinks is like the perfect one or what's allowed to be presented in media so yeah it's a it's a really interesting one especially I just found that so interesting with porn that that is actually um sent like you wouldn't think that porn is censored but they censor that in in photography porn yeah Yeah. not in yeah you know one one of the most empowering things that I ever did was I actually had my vulva um 
what do you call it? Uh, plastered, like a plastered oh, car. Yes. Uh, live on a radio station in America. And it really challenged me because I'd always joked. Um, it was a, someone that I knew who owns one of the big sex toy companies in America and they had a moulding room. And when I took a tour of the factory, you know, we were joking about, oh, we're going to get a bottle of wine and, and do our moulds. So when they saw my name come up as a guest, I get this phone call saying, oh, so-and-so wants to know if you would do the mould live on radio and I was like oh this is a challenge like could I and I put some regulations over it I was like okay I want skeleton crew I don't want like lots of people and because the way that the bed was the the glass box where the producers were were like just in front of it so I was like can we just maybe minimize how many people there are they had they wanted a photographer I said okay photographer's gonna be up this way not down that way and you'd appreciate this with your PR media skills I managed to do a whole radio show while this was happening with my friend in my face. And I decided to make, to take the opportunity to not make it smutty, but talk about vulvas and, you know, women's bodies and what we all look like. And, you know, like kept going until I had this mold removed. Um, I later had went on one of my trips back to America. They did it in what is kind of like a bronze. It looks like a bronze, but it's not a bronze. So that's quite a big piece because of my whole pelvis. And um, they said, well, next time you come back to the States, it'll be ready. You can take it home. So it was all given to me in, in bubble wrap. And I opened one side of it and I had it in my carry-on bag. And I was like, well, this is going to be interesting. So <laughs> I'm leaving LA and off my little suitcase goes through the security. And the you know the person waves me over. Is this your bag? Yep. And I'm going, oh, my God. <laughs> And, you know, he opens it up and I'd left it half open because I knew that it was it was going to send a sensor off. They were going to go, what's this big thing? And he goes, there's some big green thing in your bag. I said to him, you have a look and you tell me what you think it is. And he goes, okay. <laughs> opens it up, has a look, goes, puts it back and goes, it's very beautiful. <laughs> <That's> awesome. <laughs> So I, and, and I think he knew that it, it must have looked like the way that it was all wrapped, that it was obviously evolved. And I, it was one of those moments I thought, I wish, you know, I wish that was something that women had more access to because it's very different to look at yourself on a photo on your iPhone or getting a mirror yeah. to actually having somebody take a mould and hold yeah. it up and go, this is me, this is what I look like. Yeah. Um, and it's quite, it's very empowering, but it's a great way to not only explore your vulva, but also celebrate it. Mm. Um, it's a piece that I have. It is put away because there are people that come in and out of my apartment and I live with other people, um, but I'm still very proud of it. And yeah. you know, one day when I have a lovely office somewhere post COVID, it'll be up on the wall. <laughs> I love that. What an empowering thing to do. And hats off to you that you were able to do an entire radio show <laughs> while doing that. Wow. That is multitasking to the max. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Love it. Um, and finally, if we've got any questions, pop them here, guys. I don't think we've had too many. Um, Oh, this is an interesting one, actually. Very interesting when I think about my sons and what or how I'd like to educate them on the reality in terms of women's and men's bodies versus what they see on porn sites, as well as norm normalizing all varieties of women's bodies and pubic care, et cetera, as well as my daughter when she's older. That, yeah, it is it is an interesting one. I've got two boys, so um, I think about that a lot too. You know, it's not just women, it's also men and what is mm – -hmm normal for what their bodies look like too so it's yeah it's a conversation for both genders and I think um, I love what you've raised because we can often as women and you know there's only women in this group um, think about it from a female perspective instead of the fact that the same challenges exist for men and probably aren't even spoken about as much as they are for women well let's have a look at the size debate you know here we are as women we go on and on about men dictating how we feel about our vulva areas but yet men are shamed so much more for their genitals I actually think that we haven't seen in a way we haven't seen the equality happen for men because women mock men all the time um, women make fun of what someone's size is what they look like 
and we don't hear men up in arms about that. And I think that's something as women that we need to consider that if we want to be respected for exactly who we are and how we look, then we also need to give that respect in return. And I get that, you know, men are also involving themselves in the the locker room debate about size. But sometimes the way I've heard women and hear women still talk about men and their sexual performance and their genitals, I think, no wonder why there's so many guys out there that are suffering from premature ejaculation because they're scared shitless when they get a woman in the bed because they're worried about how they're going to be judged and ridiculed and what they're going to say. So we're not we're not always so different. And I think that we need to consider that, you know, how we talk about someone's body, no matter what their gender is, needs to be respectful. It doesn't matter what you look like. We yeah. need to give everyone the same respect and we need to give everyone the same permission about owning their sexuality and their genitals. Mm. And if we can have that narrative when we talk about, you know, whether you're raising boys or girls or you're raising a child that identifies differently, then no matter what someone's genitals are, then we need to keep having that messaging about, you know, respect for yourselves and for other people, but also that people are different. Mm. I mean, your children and, you know, hopefully one day my children are going to grow up in a very different world to what we did. And we Mm. knew women had vulvas and boys had penises and they're going to grow up in this world of people identifying differently and being a vulva owner but potentially being you know non-binary and someday saying they identify more as a woman and other days saying that they identify more as a man mm. um you know you they're going to see a lot more kids and young adults transition genders so really when we have a look at the male women debate about respect for our bodies and our genitals it needs to be a universal thing because we need to just give people that space to be able to respect and own what they have no matter what it is and how they identify Mm, yeah it's such an important thing for us to discuss like yeah there's there's so much that we need Uh, we could be here for an hour (laughs) about this um this is such an important discussion and guys please do um you know get involved in this conversation if you are watching the replay Um, which brings me to the exciting giveaway that we've got tonight. If you do comment, ask a question, get involved in the conversation in the comments of this um, video in the next 24 hours, if you're on live or if you're watching the replay, we have a very awesome giveaway for you, very relevant for the, um, the topic and the conversation tonight. And that is a one on one session with Nikki where she's going to actually help you and guide you on what sex toy to get and what sex toy is the best for you, which this is, this is not available to the general public. Well, it's only just started on my website, but I haven't promoted it yet. So this is something brand new that I've been offering um, that I'm calling the sex toy consult because I get inundated with questions about what products someone should get. And like we were talking about before we hit record, uh, sex toys are not something that you can take back if it doesn't fit or if you don't like it. (laughs) Um, So it's really important that you get the right thing for you, you understand it, uh, but it also gives people an opportunity to um, ask any questions, but also myth bust some fears that they might have, insecurities, discuss how they introduce it into a relationship, any concerns that they have, but also they're able to explore products and choose something that is right for them. Um, so normally this is something that's sold with the cash back, but um, I'm giving this session away and throwing in a $20 cash uh, voucher to be able to use on Dr. Nikki's shop. Um, and I very much look forward to doing this with somebody that is sex toy curious, keen, mm. to, keen to explore this world because I know someone else on this conversation that's exploring this world. <laughs> Yes, and it is eye-opening. And I've got to say a massive thank you to you, Nikki, because you, you're helping me navigate <laughs> very like. I was like, what else can I send you? And I was like, oh, oh. my friends at Love Hammer, they were like, I was like, they're really yes. good with giveaways. And I was, I emailed them and I said, can you please send someone I know a hammer? Um, <laughs> which is such a fun, um, my partner's a builder. So I was like, when these people contacted me, I was like, I love this. Cause you can also get like a little tool belt for it. Oh, um, really? That is yeah, the it's, 
they've got a really good little uh, marketing spiel. So it's, so definitely a, it's definitely a fun product. Yeah. So guys, the next, um, the next review is the love hammer. It was hilarious when it showed up because obviously you guys know I have a four-year-old and I, I used it. Um, my husband and I used it together. It was great. It was a lot of fun. And then I washed it, you know, put it away, but the box was still out and the box is, oh my gosh, it was so funny. The box is like the foam insert is like obviously just foam and then the, the um, you know, shape of a hammer and my four-year-old came in I was in the shower came in and he was like banging on the wall and I was like what are you doing and he's like I'm hammering and I was like how did he find it and then I came out and he had the foam thing like just hammering uh, I was like okay maybe put that away. That's, the, that's the thing with these a lot of these products is that they're different shapes and sizes these days and kids just have no idea and I think no we've idea. just got to chill out a bit about it and just go you know what if your kid finds your vibrator it's not the end of the world and if they do have to define something that is phallic like and they ask a question then it's a really good mm-hmm. opener for a conversation yeah. about how pleasure is normal and I think we need to stop freaking out that we are going to rob kids of their innocence um, and take yeah. away their childhood by talking to them about sex yeah absolutely it, it's it's an it's very normal conversation in our house my mum just also lives with us so <laughs> I was like, that'll also be a really open conversation at the breakfast table if he takes it out, out from there. So it was an interesting one and I look forward to writing up a proper review on it because I have only used it once. So I'm looking forward to using it more. I also realized I need to put batteries in it. I was like, I was happy with just how it was. And then I was like, oh, there's some buttons here. So I'll, I'll have a bit more of a play around with it, guys, and then give you a full um, detailed review on it. So thank you so much, Nikki. I'm so excited for whoever um, actually gets to have the consult with you because I think that is such an awesome idea. Like if anyone else is new to this world like I am, like I would have no idea where to start either. So I think that's just such an awesome offering. So um, if you have been watching us, comment below. If you're watching the replay, comment your biggest um, takeout from all of the wisdom that Nikki shared tonight. And thank you so much, Nikki, for your time and everything tonight. That was such a good conversation. Thanks for having me. Thanks for letting me flex my um, sexual intellectual muscle tonight. (laughs) You look beautiful. You have given us so much wisdom and empowerment and now we're all off to have a very fun evening. (laughs) I was about to say, well, it's bedtime, isn't it, for some people? Yes. (laughs) Bedtime without the sleep. Absolutely. (laughs) Thank you so much, love. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And thanks for joining, guys. We'll see you in Wildly Empowered Women. (laughs) Bye.